Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for coming and for the organizers. And when we were discussing with uh, Ilya the, the subject of the topic for this conference, uh, he told me that <coughs> architecture is a very interesting subject because, in, in his opinion, um, it's not discussed enough. I quite agreed on that. And um, I started to think why we're not discussing architecture on the Holocaust Memorial architectures enough at the conferences like that, gatherings, professional gatherings like that. Well, I think, first of all, we have psychological thing here. Um, uh, Holocaust, it's extremely emotional experience. And it addresses to a, a personal and very intimate inner psycho of people. So for that purpose uh, and for that essence of it, um, visual arts and melody, music and literature, as you saw today that <coughs> one artist said that I, ca I can't express myself well enough, I leave it to the artist. Uh, so it leaves uh, the Holocaust reappreciation, if you wish, readdressing reflection leaves in the other department of our psycho. And while we have architecture and which is buildings and they are cold and they are abstract, too far abstract for people to, to get connected into that. Very interestingly, the architect uh, from, about whom I'm talking today, Professor Mahlamiaki, he says about this the following quote, when talking about buildings of this character, a building must be more than a building. It's not enough if a building would be fit technically. That kind of building has to create space, the space for emotions. Both create emotions but itself and to create the space for people to meditate, to have an individual, personal, unique in each case, emotional experience of their own. Uh, quote, quote, finished, <coughs> unquote. This is enormously difficult task but it's the only way to succeed in the memorial architecture. And it's exactly what Rainer Mohlamiaki is doing. And he did uh, from 2008 till today, he created five major uh, and very different projects on um, memorial architects. Before we'll go to the projects, um, I think that we also need to reflect uh, on the way on how we are uh, on the impact of war on architecture and vice versa. S uh, normally, people are memorializing uh, after wars their victory, right? Every country memorializes their victory. They are prevailing, overcoming. But Second World War was not an any war. It concluded the Holocaust as its core element. And Holocaust has, if you wish, its own architecture. But yet before that, <coughs> we have to essential question to reply. What we're actually memorializing? The horror, the annihilation, the humanization, how to come to terms with the historical truth on the Holocaust and the human needs of memorialization. How to do it today, eight decades after the most horrible period in human history, thinking on its impact tomorrow and for some more time ahead. Professor Mahlamiaki has his opinion on that. Quote, to me, after reading everything what has been possibly written about the Holocaust to work for my several projects on that, the mass murder of the Jews didn't end in 1945. I am positive that the history of the architecture for buildings in this category will not end. I'm also quite sure that after 200 years, the meaning of the memorials to the Holocaust victims would be yet more important for mankind. Some people may think that memorial direction in architecture is not that necessary, not that important. But when you begin to learn more about the history of the Shah, about concrete history of concrete places, say a small village in Lithuania where 600 people were exterminated in two days, an entire life and tradition of several centuries had been whipped away for good. You are engrossed into that knowledge and it has become a foundation of your vision as an architect. Uh, so, um, 
Now, the question for the architect at the C by Professor Mahlamiaki and myself, I'm working with him on major project on memorial architectures uh, for book and film, is again, what we are remembering in means, by means of architecture, the magnanimity of crime, but civilized nations and civilized society doesn't do that thing. The miracle of survival, but leaves uh, lives of hundreds of thousands of survivors many years after this end of this Second World War was a hell. So it didn't end it psychologically there. In general, overall, we are memorializing a warning, warning. And of course, we are making our compassion visible. Professor Mahlamiaki is known for his aphoristic phrase, uh, what he said in 2018, in connection with his requiem project for the Museum of the Siege of Leningrad in St. Petersburg. Compassion has no nationality. By this phrase, he won the hearts of everyone who was, has anything to do with this project. But there is more on his vision on this essential subject of the memorial architect. To create a memorial building is very demanding, both emotionally and morally, he said. To be able to work on this project successfully, you have to be very sensitive. Memorial architecture, and in particular, the one that deals with the Holocaust, requires deep personal emotional involvement. Without it, the project will not be possible to create. Because you're not creating more than a building, you're creating both inside and outside this space where people would be having both specific and universal at the same time emotional experience. You, an architect, are creating a space for remembrance. From that point of view, there is a special and crucially important fact. The Shoah itself has uh, an architecture of, it, of its own. As we all know, uh, ghettos and camps uh, had their own structures, its own buildings, their own building plans, uh, constructions, and in many cases, like Mauthausen, Plaschow, Dachau, Buchenwald, Auschwitz, and the others, that space, the crime set effectively had its own architecture, if you will. And this frames the mind of us as a viewers and public and also as architects. Uh, Mahlamiaki sees it in the same way. Memorial, just one second, I have to head a glass. Sorry. Memorial architecture is a special category of architecture because of all its background and its meaning. People are expecting to see in those memorial buildings the things which are above and separate from daily life. I would even say that people are expecting to see the things which are opposite our daily life, our everyday environment and routine. In this sense, memorial architecture and its function and role today, it's not that far from the role of churches and synagogues, the places of worship and prayer in the past. I would say that from my point of view, this role of memorial architecture today, in fact, is very close to the role of synagogues and churches. People are visiting the places of the memorial buildings today in hope and with a desire to be themselves to become free of everyday routine in order to be able to concentrate on our own humanity. This point, to be able to concentrate on our own humanity, this to me defines the purpose and the role of the modern ar memorial architecture today. In my uh, analysis of this, I was thinking about several dimensions of um, architecture uh, which applies to memorial architecture. Historical dimension, which uh, can be seen in Mahlamiaki's Pauline Museum. Human dimension, Lost Shtetl project in Lithuania. Spiritual dimension, also uh, project Lost Shtetl in Lithuania. Public dimension, Pauline. Artistic dimension, 
which can be seen in Requiem, and in our case, a Jewish dimension, which is very well illustrated by the project um, for Heaven, uh, UK National Holocaust Memorial. And um, it's also very significant that we are <clears throat> able to illustrate all these dimensions which applies to memorial architecture on the um, case studies of five very different um, Holocaust-connected memorials of the one architect. And, and he never repeats himself. In my, in my view, it, it's very, very important what he says. In the places of memorial architecture today, we are seeking, we are searching for our own soul. This is his understanding, what he is doing. We are not expecting uh, to be influenced by art or even by knowledge, but we are coming to, the, to those places to have a dialogue with ourselves. I think it's also, um, we're not very often not talking about it in, uh, <clears throat> with regard to modern artists and modern architects. We are always thinking from pers uh, perspective and from distance. In this case, I think it's very important. <clears throat> it also provides a multi-dimensional material to analyze the role in which the contemporary memorial architect plays in our current readdressing the Holocaust. And this, our own current readdressing the Holocaust in different ways, fields, and dimensions, in my opinion, is the most important phenomenon in the commemorating <clears throat> the Holocaust in general. Why? Because with 80 years after the Holocaust, the psychological and social functions of the very process of this commemoration has changed. And now it tells about us. It sets the guidelines for us, both for today and for tomorrow. The way in which and how we are commemorating the Holocaust, to me, is a litmus test on our own humanity. Professor Mahlamiaki shares this opinion with me. There is a cardinal difference between a museum, he says, and a building of memorial architecture dedicated to Holocaust. The museum, for museum, people are coming to learn to the places of memorial architecture, people are coming to remember. At these places, we are trying to remember on three levels, historical, uh, the past, current, the present, and future. In every project on memorial architecture, he says, I'm working on these three levels simultaneously to keep them all present and every my project. To fulfill this principle is a precondition to me. It's a prerequisite starting point for any successful project in memorial architecture. Uh, two words about difference in American and European way of <coughs> building uh, and memorializing in architecture. When you analyze the global scene of memorial architecture today, you can see a quite clear difference. <coughs> Those are American <coughs> Holocaust museums, and the next slide would be European. And of course, it uh, relays on traditional preferences in architectural expression. American way is bold, mighty, and manifesting. And the European uh, tradition is more subtle, uh, detail-focused, and especially in me memorial architecture, more sensitive, in, in more, more subtle way. Uh, but there is something else, and this is something else, is a combination of several factors. Says Mahlamiaki, and this is important for uh, our region, I think, and our audience. After the collapse of communism, <clears throat> the theme of the Holocaust in memorial architecture has become very popular all over the European space especially in Central and Eastern Europe and, Bal and Baltic countries, naturally. We are facing the challenge, how to create a history again. The history that disappeared. Maybe, not surprisingly, he says, but there are very few architects, certainly so in Northern Europe, Baltic states, and Scandinavia, who are working productively in this area today. You have to answer the principal question, what is your message? And most importantly, you have to create a special language because you need to create a building and a space, both inside and outside, which has to be timeless and universal. I will examine his projects individually. 
and I will comment on, on all of it. But the most important, from his point of view, is the role of a space. And this is Pauline. Uh, he says, in the cases of memorial architecture, buildings very often are supposed to be located on the sites which are cemeteries or the sites of mass murder. This sets important, this sets important prerequisite. The building in question must be also a memorial per se. Uh, to be a memorial adequately, it's not enough for the building to sit on the physical site. Uh, the whole area uh, of this place is very special indeed. And your task as an architect is to create a certain universal space that should be speaking on the place and its history. And this is what memorial architecture is about. Now I will be jumping. Uh, in Pauline, for instance, um, I think what is interesting, you, you cannot see it inside, especially museum, and uh, uh, any uh, direct or triangular line, it's all curves. And um, as you know, Pauline has been uh, voted the best museum in the world by UNESCO in 2016. And um, here and in all his project, Light become a main protagonist. Uh, and also the metaphor, very interesting metaphor here in, in this uh, down uh, picture, the split through all, all through the museum. Many people and many specialists are saying that this is a splitting of the sea, of the sea, seas of reeds. While Mahlamiaki said to me that it can be, it started in his head like that, but uh, in fact, uh, it is the split which symbolized the split of Jewish people after the Holocaust and the lasting trauma of it after the Second World War. Uh, this next one is a brown house project, which is a project for the documentation center of the history of national socialism uh, in Munich. <coughs> and in the, the place, it's notorious brown house. And now he, uh, this is the only uh, project on Holocaust where he used rectangulants and he used direct lines because of, of, of the site, because it was the favorite, uh, the, the, the very nest of, of Nazism. And for this project, sobriety and concentration uh, for creating a new and airy and enlightening place for having an extra volume uh, of, of actually <laughs> proceeding uh, the, the material which are inside, because this is actually the library of National Socialist Party. A terrible docu documents are there. So it's, um, he gives uh, people space in order to, to process it. Uh, here we have Heaven in London, a project for the UK National Holocaust Memorial and Educational Center. And this is very interesting because place, it's very next to, to the um, uh, Westminster. So place is very strict, strictly organized. And he gets everything underground. And those two arcs, it's also arcs of Jewish, um, uh, popular Jewish di di diaspora before and after the Holocaust. So it's, uh, it's, it's in parallel and it's stunning similarity, but there it's a very huge, uh, un uncrossable uh, distance between them. Here, the beautiful project for the Requiem <coughs> Museum of the uh, Siege of Leningrad, which uh, despite everything what has been done in the city of St. Petersburg, twice won uh, the public vote uh, last year. <laughs> and this is a very innovative uh, material. And, and, and uh, so we have three floors underground. And from three floors underground, you do have this only one spiral, which gets a new metaphor of thread of life. Uh, the last one is Los Stettel. It's a beautiful project <laughs> created, built it uh, in the construction now um, in uh, Shedova in Lithuania, two hours from Vilnius. And this is, you see, uh, beautifully restored and prized by UNESCO uh, Cemetery. This place uh, is gone. Life is gone, people are gone. So how you remember this? You, you create a dream. So this place is a dream. And I think it's a special dream. 
So uh, just very briefly to say that uh, Professor Mahlamiaki uh, eventually during last uh, 11, 12 years has developed a unique bond between each of his projects. Uh, which is continue for Pauline, it's his people. He, every, every year he comes to, to Warsaw on the uprising date and he stays with people there and he, he needs it. It's Los Stettel, it's the way of remembrance. In London, it's a matter of rethinking of Jewish destiny in Europe and so on. And then very briefly <laughs> to conclude, uh, there are very characteristic features in memorial architecture of this very outstanding architect. Elegance as a main feature of his project, aesthetic beauty, innovative usage of material in all his buildings and projects, and lighting. He is one of the rare masters who is extremely well working with light, which is, by the way, very, very difficult. Lacanism and understandment, because if you would like to know the word what he himself uses the most when he speaks about his work, it's modesty. Modest, modest, modest project, modest approach. Modesty, it's his prerequisite. Ability to create metaphor, special understanding of nature, openness as a resolution. And uh, just very briefly, I just would like to say one word about humanity because in all uh, analyzing, in all understanding of very difficult work, of very difficult subject, I came to the conclusion, and I'm working with him for many years, that humanity is both beginning and the end. So if you have humanity in your approach, uh, you win. If you don't, whatever professional you are, you will not create anything that people will be willing uh, to come and will be always remembered to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Also, just more, more like a comment from uh, from what, what what you've been telling us. Telling us um, that it seems like the most uh, characteristic principle. Maybe almost. Maybe you can comment if he uh, is speaking about it in like your conversations. This, um, yeah, really surprising uh, ability to overcome the heaviness of the really this difficult, tragical history and uh, uh, like the uh, memorization and also the ar uh, architecture which is uh, dealing with these themes uh, quite often focuses on this uh, the aspect uh, of Very victimization heavy. and uh, here it's something completely di opposite. The, so. I, I wouldn't like to say any names but I think you're absolutely right because very often when, when I'm lecturing and we have a big student workshops uh, we do have people who said well you know there are some places when people almost have a heart attack so difficult they are, so suffocating and gloomy and grim. And, and uh, this man, he really has uh, unique, to me, unique ability to overcome, and, and probably he sees, the, I think he sees the purpose differently, I think, because he's not frightening you. He doesn't like to frighten you. He would like to, to remember you in very decent, uh, to remind you in very decent way. In, uh, because I think for Finland in general, in Finnish character, national character, if I may say so, uh, respect is absolutely basic word. So respect yourself, your, respect others, respect history. When people are growing up with the concept of respect, I think they're not frightening you, even on, on the frightening subject. So because they're guarding your, your privacy, if you wish, and, and your inner world. I think he's very special in this respect. Thank You're you. right. Um, questions from the audience? Okay, this seems there's no questions. Then we can uh, proceed with, as we are a little bit um, short. In, what, are they? Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't see. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how memorials will be treated in 100 years, 200 years, 300 years? Well, we have the present memorials. Which of those are likely to, to be here? Which, will there be new memorials? Well, you know, I, I have to imagine in 300 years there will be fewer memorials than there mm. are today. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. I think it's a very good question. And he, um, if not, Mahlamiaki would talk to me about this 200 years idea I wouldn't come to think about. What I came to think about that um, 
indeed, a um, number of memorials, for instance, in the States are mushrooming now. So they, they, they have to have every uh, Holocaust museum and educational center in every state. So we would have 40 more uh, there. And I think that we would have in uh, coming 10, 15 years, we would have much more than we have today. But then, of course, it will, I agree with you, it will stop. As for 300 years, I couldn't say. Um, 100, I think we will survive, I think. And as I said, it's, it's, it's up to us. For instance, um, the Br British um, uh, uh, Imperial Museum of War today are redoing, my colleagues, I'm working with them, they are redoing Holocaust galleries. So they do, and, and they are, you probably know, they're young people who are doing it. And this is totally different concept. What is what their point of view? The suffering, human suffering. So they are addressing a human suffering and every single centimeter of the renewed uh, Holocaust galleries. So I do think that we will survive for 100 years. And I, I hope that our grand grand grandchildren will, will have humanity enough to, and knowledge. Humanity they have, I'm sure. Knowledge. My pleasure. More questions? Yes. Uh, hello. Thank you for your presentation. I'm interested in the comparison between American and European mm -hmm. memorial culture. Was it uh, mm -hmm. memorial architecture in general? Or uh, Holocaust I, saw, I thought that somebody would be interested in that. Yeah. Um, no. I think this is, this is about, about Holocaust museums. Why? Because, as I said just now, in the States, they are mushrooming. They are just coming in, in tents. So they were waiting for 40 years, right? The, the first museum appeared in 1993. And if not, Elie Wiesel, we don't know when we will, we will get it, I know, but I wouldn't say when. And then after that, a critical point, so a tip of, I don't know, the, the idea of, of memori memorialization started to, to be infectious there. And then uh, in, in Chicago, there is a private museum, and very good one, and it's different. And then uh, Atlanta, uh, Michigan, you name it, Detroit, everywhere, just every Dallas, huge museum in da Los Angeles, too. And they are massive because it's a huge country, <laughs> and they have many people, and they do have this vision of the world. When you are in the States, and you're asking your friends, who are very active politically, so when you're traveling next, where you're traveling next, they say, why? We, we're here, we are, we are fine. We are. So I think that they are creating, uh, as far as I know, and I'm teaching there, so they are creating a huge space of, of their own, a huge memorialization, because they were late. This is my theory. This is my personal understanding. Uh, while in, in Hungary and here in Lithuania, uh, People are thinking about a very touching detail about which you wouldn't be able to speak for a good 50 years. Two generations passed, our parents, our grandparents, and now only we can speak about it. So what we're speaking about? We're speaking about somebody's personal photograph, right? Somebody's personal belonging and to making out of it um, a symbol like it's done in, in Budapest, the uh, uh, Donahue Synagogue. So I think this is a principle of um, different perception of, of, of the way of communalization. But I, I, I think that it's only with Holocaust. I, I think that what we're talking about museum, museum for modern art, which Professor Mahlamiaki actually created for Riga, for Latvia, I don't know if you know, um, very similar to museum in Washington. So it was a good question of you. It, it's, it's a good point. Thank you. Are there more questions? Uh, okay. We, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we proceed with our next speaker, and the next speaker is uh, Peter. Yeah. <laughs>